Hi folks, this is Jay. Um, I want to talk to you for a few minutes on a very important topic. And uh, you turn to um, Romans chapter 5. And Romans chapter 5, verse 12, in a minute. But what I want to talk to you about is Adam and Eve. And I'm going to refer to a very scholarly article underneath that will help you think through this issue theologically. Okay, there are people who do the science. But what we're going to do in this video is just think about the issue theologically. And the issue is this, what is the theological cost for going with the idea that Adam and Eve were not real people? That they were symbolic of a fall alright what is the theological cost of saying that Adam and Eve were real people okay that that's what I want us to think about right so let's read the passage uh, in Romans chapter 5 Verse 12, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass, for as many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by grace of the one man Jesus Christ abounded for the many. The free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift uh, following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, one man's uh, trespass, death reigned through the one, man much more will those who receive the abundance of grace grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man jesus christ therefore as one trespass led to condemnation for all men so one act of righteousness leads to justification and the life for all men for as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous now the law came in the increase of the trespass, but where sin increases, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ. So there we've got a parallel between Adam and Jesus. And it's saying, Paul saying that Adam sinned, Jesus didn't sin. Adam fell, Jesus didn't fall. Adam brought man into condemnation, Jesus brought man and women into unification with God through his death and resurrection those who believe in him there's a, there's a clear historical parallel Adam is clearly seen by Paul as a historical person and right through uh, the New Testament Jesus and other uh, teachers in the New Testament and, and our Lord Jesus saw Adam as a real person now we've got a new generation of theologians, some of them I, I greatly respect, such as N.T. Wright and many, many others. And these are very sophisticated theologians, and they are calling for us to see Rome, uh, see uh, Adam as as a, an allegory, that he wasn't really a historical figure. What that does is basically it means that sin did not really come into the world. It means that sin is not real. It means that when Christ died on a cross, he didn't die for literal sin. It was all an allegory. Now, these sophisticated theologians will give you all the twists and turns that you need and show you that actually Genesis chapter 1, 2 and 3, looking in its cultural context, the writer is not actually trying to teach us about history and all the rest of it. They have these cultural, sophisticated, 
hermeneutical methods and they will beguile you and you will take it all in and think oh yes oh yes it's very convincing very very convincing but I would say it's very very disastrous your theology has to start with what the Bible teaches first and then you go to surrounding culture uh, you go to the, you know, read the writings of surrounding culture of, of when Genesis was written and, and whatever. But it's very clear in the Bible, very, very clear from the Lord Jesus to the Apostle Paul that Adam was a literal person. And if you go the side of the new thinkers on this, then it will be disastrous for your Christian faith. You might think you're being all sophisticated and intellectual and using better hermeneutical tools because you're thinking you're using it in the context, cultural context and you get the finer nuances of the reading of the text more than the fundamentalist, blah, blah, blah. But in reality, you've gone against the Lord Jesus Christ and you've gone against the Apostle Paul and you've gone against the New Testament. That's in reality what you've done. And that's disastrous. Now you might come back and say, well, what about science? Science contradicts the age of the earth as opposed to Genesis chapter 1, 2 and 3. I would suggest two things. That, that the Bible is actually more scientific than actual science. Science is rooted in nature and all the knowledge that we know within science changes so what scientists can say one day can change in a hundred years time any knowledge that's rooted in nature is always going to change but we're rooting our faith on the eternal word of God that is eternal that doesn't change that's more scientific you can gain a more scientific knowledge of God when something does not change than on something that does sift it and change throughout time Second thing is we're, that we're talking about the history of the world. Now, on both sides of the camp, whether it be the creationist or whether it be the evolutionist, they all speak dogmatically about the past. And I would say to you that after you after you get past four or five thousand years, anything after that, you start getting dogmatic. Then you're just being dogmatic. I think we have to hold any theory about origins um, with a pinch of salt I don't think that you can go back that far in time and be absolutely dogmatic either, either as an evolutionist or a creationist in the end it's about what you want to believe and why you want to believe it the fact of the matter is every society has its own myth in order to confirm its own identity in order for it to achieve the things that it wants to achieve politically, politically, culturally and socially. The Egyptians had their creation myths and they used their creation myths to, politi to politicize, to change their people, to, 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 to get them to follow the culture, the political and social agenda that they wanted. And in modern times, since the time of Darwin, modern culture, modern society, the intellectual elites have used evolution as a myth in order for them to develop their political, cultural and social agendas. That's their myth. That's what they're using. And it's all about their identity, what they wanted to achieve. In the 19th century, many cultures wanted to cut themselves away from the church's power and authority. And therefore evolution was part of that challenge to produce a new secular identity. In the 1920s, there was a lot of issues about national identity in terms of race. And evolution was used quite extensively in Western Europe to propagate and defend a racist agenda. You only look at the 1920s in America, 1920s in, in Europe, and how eugenics was used. Uh, and it was fueled by an understanding of evolution. Evolution was used quite extensively uh, by Hitler and his henchmen uh, to justify the killing and slaughter of um, of um, 
of of Jews and gays and all sorts. Evolution was used extensively to promote free love in the 1960s. Evolution has been used extensively uh, today to continue the battering ram against the far uh, against the right, the religious right in America. You see, it's a it's a it's a myth. Just like the Egyptians had a myth. Just like the Babylonians had a myth. So evolution is a myth that is used to politicize, to culturalize and socialize communities according to the intellectual elites who want to form society in the image that they want to go in. So I would say that don't buy into it. Stick to your Bible. Okay? I'm not saying there is evidence but I'm not. Say, I'm, not, I'm saying that there is evidence for creation, and there is no evidence for evolution. But what I'm saying is, don't be so dogmatic as to think that these modern scholars in science can say categorically X, Y, Z about the past after 6,000 BC, because I'm telling you that they can't. And you're being browbeaten by the sophisticated science. You're being browbeated by these sophisticated theologians. And at the end of the day, when you actually sit back and you actually analyze it, it's just a puff of smoke. And it'll change. In a thousand years' time, what they're saying, if, we, if the Lord doesn't come back, will have changed. But the eternal word of God will not have changed. That's my thinking. I don't listen... I'm not listening to what the cultural intellectual elites are saying about evolution. And I'm not listening to the intellectual elite theologians. I'm listening to God and his word. That's my primary loyalty. And if anything conflicts with the word of God, then I stick with the word of God. Does that mean I, I, I put my head in the sand? Am I, I, am I not aware of modern scholarship on on science and how it might contradict the Bible. Am I not aware of these sophisticated theologians? Of course I am. I read these sophisticated theologians all the time. The Biologos crowd, I read them all the time. Fully aware of their methodologies. On science, I'm willing to listen and study and hear what the scientists are saying and the scholars are saying in their various fields scientifically. We, we don't put our head in the sand and hide away from what they're saying. What I'm saying is that when you put the word of God first, you become on solid ground. You start to feel that science or these intellectual theologians have more authority than the word of God and you're moving into shifting sand. You might modify the Bible to suit whatever the culture is saying but you ain't biblical you ain't a disciple of Christ you're a disciple of modern culture you're a disciple of the modern scientists you're a disciple of the modern intellectual theologians you're not a disciple of Christ you're not being faithful to him it doesn't mean to say that you bury your head in the sands and be anti-intellectual no no you be a true intellectual and you be vigorously researching the answers that you can find to their questions. But at the end of the day, your loyalty is to the Word of God. Has to be. Otherwise, you will destroy the Christian faith. And I say to you who are theologians today, you biologos theologians, with your sophisticated hermeneutical tools, I kid you not, you might know, some of you might know the Lord Jesus Christ, but you are destroying the Christian faith. You are not liberating the fundamentalist to think in a more enlightened way. No, 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 no. You are liberating people from Christ. You are liberating people into the harms of the devil. You are liberating people from the pure word of God. And you are liberating them into academia where they will be confused for the rest of their life. They will be confused because they moved away from the pure word of God. 
I've seen what academia can do. When they come and follow your ideas, I've seen a whole generation of young people utterly destroyed in ministry because they took your ideas on as sophisticated theologians because they get up and preach and they didn't know that A to B in the Bible they weren't confident of the Word of God they weren't confident of their Savior Lord Jesus Christ because they had all your intellectual ideas in their head and they didn't know what they believed anymore we need to get back to the Bible back, back to the th the authority of the Bible back to listening to what God is saying in the Bible then we need young men and women who are going to go off to university and seminary and be determined to be loyal to God and his word and do science and do theology loyal to the Bible and if we're seen as outmoded if we're seen as backwater evangelicals then so be it that's the price you pay for being a man and a woman of God. The academic world will never, ever, ever accept a true man of God or woman of God. You're a true academic for Jesus. You will be mocked for your loyalty to Jesus Christ. And as an academic, the reason why many of you are academics in, in Cambridge and Oxford and in Harvard and Princeton the reason why you are top evangelical academics I tell you why is because you have compromised because you wanted to find a middle way out so that you could look a little bit sophisticated to your your peers so that you could be able to lecture in these institutions but the moment you say that Genesis chapter 1, 2 and 3 is history you'll be out on your ears you will not be seen as a serious professor in theology. You know that. You'll be thrown out. You will be thrown out. The reason why you're a top academic in a top academic institution as an evangelical is because you are a person who will not stand up for Jesus. That's why you wouldn't have got there unless it was that you compromised and you compromised you did your degree and you realized if you were going to get on you had to play the game then you did your MA and you realized if I'm going to get on I got to play the game and you did your PhD and you thought if I'm going to get to, to where I'm going to go I've got to fudge it here I've got to fudge it there and you played the game and you got your PhD and then you got you got appointed and you got some publications and you like the idea of being seen as a professor of theology and they give you a high chair and they patted you on the back and you they said oh what a great academic he is but you went and left Jesus oh yeah you know Jesus you love Jesus but you went and compromised his name and you convinced yourself with your sophisticated hermeneutics and your sophisticated ideas that you found a way forward, a middle road, to satisfy the academics in the academic world. But at the end of the day, you compromised. At the end of the day, you blinded the church. And the church has become confused because of academics like you. Biologos, you might be sophisticated. You might have written many, many books between you. But at the end of the day, Biologos, you are perverting the gospel of Christ and you are perverting the word of God and that's the end of it. And you can look at me and say he's a bit of a fundamentalist. You might look at me as a fundamentalist but at the end of the day I'm fundamentally for Jesus and I'm fundamentally for his word. I'm not anti-intellectual. I'm not anti-scholarship but I will not lead the people of God astray away from the word of God like you are doing. So who are you going to stand for, Biologos? Going to continue to be your nice little sophisticated scholarship? Pandering to the academic world? Proud of your own academic achievements? Feeling that you've achieved a middle way? No, you haven't achieved a middle way. You've given the armor of God into the hands of the devil. You have fed the people of God, not with the wheat and manner of the word of God, but with the academic 
intellectual tools that you've inherited over 200 years since the Enlightenment, that's all you have fed the people of God. You have not fed the people of God the Word of God. And I say to every pastor and every preacher out there today, that you have a responsibility to stop listening to these posh academics. You have a responsibility to stand up for God. I have made a video on some academics, and I love them dearly, but they have compromised some of them on the Word of God. Two of them do not believe in inerrancy, that I did a, a video on five great evangelical theologians. Two of them did not believe, do not believe in inerrancy. I greatly respect them and I greatly love them and I, I appreciate the great work that they have done but they are compromised. And the power of God will not work in a, a western church that compromises the word of God. We cannot compromise God's word. We cannot compromise Christ. We cannot compromise biblical truth. If we do it's disastrous my friend. I'm sorry that I sound passionate, but I believe passionately that you cannot compromise the Word of God. You cannot read the New Testament and not see that from the New Testament, Adam is a literal historical person. If you change that for whatever sophisticated hermeneutical method that you use, you've changed it. And you've compromised. And you can dance and fiddle about and do all the nuanced methodologies that you want on Genesis you compromise at the end of the day 